My name is April Lawson Cornfield, Braver Angels Director of Debates, and I will be the moderator for tonight's conversation. America's Public Forum, as you may know, is Braver Angels' premier national speaker event series, working to bridge the world's thoughtful analysis, scholarship, journalism, and activism on the one hand, and grassroots citizen-based depolarization work on the other. We aim to bring together folks of goodwill and thoughtful insight from every corner of the American spectrum and all intellectual traditions to explore the great questions of American public life and help us all think through things a little more clearly. Tonight's conversation will touch on fundamental questions of progress and virtue in American institutional life today. And frankly, I think you're in for a treat. This is one of the, uh, I expect this to be one of our best in quite some time. So to introduce our illustrious speakers, I would like to pass to my colleague, Braver Angels National Ambassador, the one and only John Wood Jr. <laughs> and thank you very much, April. And uh, thank you to all of you for joining what I think does promise to be uh, a deep and insight rich conversation. Uh, a conversation that uh, highlights uh, and places in dialogue uh, two theses that on the surface at, at least might appear to be somewhat at odds with each other. Uh, the idea that uh, American and Western society on the one hand is living in a moment in time wherein we ought to be celebrating the tremendous progress, material and social progress of modern society. And then on the other hand, we stand perhaps at a moment of peril in terms of the life of our institutions, one in which the the future course of our society, the present trajectory of our society might find itself in doubt. Now, implicit, I believe, in the work of Braver Angels is a recognition of the fact that there is great resources and reserves of progress uh, to be counted upon in the battle against the deterioration of civic goodwill in American society. We couldn't be in a position to do the work that we have done if there was not a great bed of progress from which to build. And yet, one thing that is also perhaps richly implicit in our work and in the movement of which we are a part in Braver Angels is the idea that it is also the reserves of character and personality and virtues of of goodwill and service uh, and honor and integrity that inform our role and how it is we interact with each other in society. But these things, as I say, are somewhat perhaps implicit. These are topics that we don't always give full-throated acknowledgement to, certainly not in the mainstream public discourse. And so we seek to go quite a bit further than most conversations do on these topics in highlighting the thinking uh, and, the, and the voices of two very special and honored guests here tonight. Uh, the first uh, is one Steven Pinker. Uh, Stephen Pinker is the Johnstone Family Professor in the Department of Psychology at Harvard University, cognitive psychologist, the author of many books, including The Better Angels of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. And uh, Professor Pinker has been a voice who has caused us to adopt a, a higher perspective in terms of where society is truly situated in this current moment why and how it is we might be appreciative of the progress that we have made in this country and, and abroad. Uh, Yuval Levin, at the same time, is senior fellow of the Beth and Ravenel Curry Chair in Public Policy, Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, and Editor-in-Chief of National Affairs. He, too, is the author of many books, uh, including most recently, A uh, Time to Build, From Family and Community to Congress and the Campus, How Recommitting to Our Institutions Can Revive the American Dream. It is our deep and great pleasure to bring both of them here into conversation tonight. Uh, with the support and special thanks and acknowledgement to the American Enterprise Institute and also to the Progress Network, uh, of which both Stephen and I happen to be uh, grateful members. Uh, and now with that, back to my brilliant and noble colleague, April Lawson. We look forward to enjoying the show. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. And I just want to introduce one more little... Um, I usually chair debates and in Braver Angels debates, we always use jazz hands to show approval. And so I'm just gonna offer some jazz hands to you, John, and to our, our guests tonight. And I invite anybody who wants to, to use them at any time. Uh, they are, yes, yes, I see many of you. Yes, good, good, okay. Um, they are uh, something you can use while somebody's talking, before, after, at any point. Um, and they help to feel this, this whole Zoom thing just a little bit make this whole Zoom thing feel a little bit more communal. So 
Um, Steve and Yuval, welcome, a warm welcome to you. Uh, we are so happy to have you with us tonight. Nice to be here, thank you. Thank Angel. you very much. Absolutely, and <laughs> I wanted to, um, to, you know, we can get into the substance in a second, but I just have to share a couple like personal things. So for Steve, I just have to tell you that the, my first boyfriend in college, um, his dad was like a colleague of yours at Harvard. And we thought this was the coolest thing ever. Like when I met his dad, I was like, oh, you know, Steven Pinker, really? Wow. So this is, this is a little bit of a like, oh my gosh, this is like the real guy um, kind of moment for me, as I imagine it is for many of you. Will you share who it is? Yeah, <laughs> uh, Coslin. It was Professor Coslin. I am ashamed to it that I can't remember his first name because this was Stephen, in. Well, Stephen Coslin is not only my colleague, but he was my PhD advisor and one oh, of my closest really? friends. Yes. Wow. Back in the day, yes. he, he directed my PhD dissertation. Amazing. That's really cool. So I dated his son, Justin, who is Justin, a lovely yes. fellow. Yes, who has gone on to find someone undoubtedly much better than me. Um, <laughs> And then uh, you've all, I, you know, you and I, at this point, I feel like we go way back. I, when I worked for yep. David Brooks at the Times, um, there was, uh, David would always, oh, yes. I would sit with David in his office and he would say, um, well, I feel like I just need to ask you all this. And he would constantly refer to himself as your publisher and as like um, basically your number one fan. And so from that, I sort of acquired uh, an admiration that has um, turned into a, a series of lunches and, and they have greatly educated me. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. I, I, I really have to say how much I appreciate what Brave Angels does and particularly what you do in running uh, debates April and getting people talking <laughs> to each other. And I'm just grateful for the chance to be, uh, you know, in the same virtual room uh, with Steven Pinker, who I've learned so much from over the years. Uh, it, it's a real thrill. So thank you. Vice versa. All right, wonderful. Well, so let's dive in. Um, I would like to invite John. So as John said, part of our thinking in inviting you two particularly together is that you are two of the, the great minds uh, that sort of put forth empirically based and to some degree contradictory narratives of whether society is getting better or worse. And so I want to invite you um, each just to sort of share your, your uh, your basic argument on that. And I'll start with you, um, Steve. And so, you know, I'm sure that many folks here are familiar with your work, but just tell us a little bit about it. Remind us, um, why are things getting better in your view? Well, um, first of all, I, let me just review some evidence that things are getting better before trying to explain why, because most people are incredulous at the very idea. Mm -hmm. and that's because there's a, a very different picture of uh, the state of the world and the direction of history that you get when you base your view of the world on news and journalism, which is a highly non-random sample of the worst things that have happened to the world on, in any given day, as opposed to data where you count up things that matter, uh, dimensions of human well-being, try to estimate them at different, uh, time, uh, different times in history and just see which way the curves go. And when you do that, and that's the basis of my, uh, <clears throat> the, my, my books, Enlightenment Now and Better Angels of Our, Our Nature, you find to everyone's surprise, including mine, that a lot of things have gotten much better. In fact, most of the things that matter. So if we start with, uh, say, being healthy, wealthy, and wise, certainly longevity, most obviously, has uh, more than doubled worldwide. It used to be that life expectancy at birth was around uh, 30. Now, worldwide, it is 72, and in uh, developed countries, it's uh, more than 80. Um, wealth, uh, the, uh, 200 years ago, uh, extreme poverty, by today's definition, probably characterized 90% of humanity. Now it's about 9%. Um, wise education, it, of course, illiteracy and ignorance are our natural states. And uh, a few hundred years ago, perhaps 15% of the world's population was literate. Now it's more than 80%, 90% of people over the, uh, under the age of, uh, of 20. Um, I'll add a couple of others, namely uh, deaths in war. This is the more recent development, maybe just really a post-World War II phenomenon. But even in the year, not even counting World War II, uh, in the 
uh, late 40s, early 50s, the world probably saw about 20 uh, war deaths per 100,000 population. Now it's down to less than one per 100,000 population. So uh, wars have uh, decreased, genocides have uh, decreased. Now, it doesn't mean that everything is getting better everywhere for uh, everyone all the time. Which, and, I, and as I often say, that wouldn't be progress. That would be a miracle. And progress is not a miracle. Progress consists of people recognizing problems, trying to solve them, learning from their mistakes. Every once in a while, some of the solutions work. If you remember the ones that work and don't repeat your mistakes, then statistically, things can get better. Again, not always, and a lot of things have gotten worse in the last two years, needless to say, because we're suffering through a, a, a pandemic. But, uh, but on average, things often do uh, globally have uh, gotten better, although again, not everywhere for everyone. Very good. Well, uh, that's a bit formidable. Um, yes, jazz hands, totally, absolutely. Uh, so, you all, uh, your uh, most recent few books have explained the ways that American society in particular is not necessarily improving. It is, in fact, um, literally disintegrating in some ways. And I'd love to just hear your, uh, again, your sort of starting argument or basic idea there. Well, I, I, I'm not quite as pessimistic as that makes it sound. I'm actually quite hopeful about America, but I worry about the ways in which we perceive our situation. The argument I'd make, the argument of, of my most recent book, for example, really begins with the very important facts that Stephen just laid out, um, which are facts. They just are. Uh, you, you can want to be a pessimist, but you can't create your own facts, and those facts are real, and we should be very, very grateful for them. There's the, there's the additional puzzling fact that despite all that, American society is in a sour mood uh, about the future, in some ways about the present, and not just a sour mood, but that in some important respects, we're, we're yeah. living through a social crisis. Um, we can see that in all kinds of things, from vicious kind of partisan polarization to all sorts of, uh, of culture war resentments to isolation and alienation and despair that, that does present itself in some clear empirical realities too, in higher suicide rates, in an epidemic of opioid abuse in parts of our society. And those kind of dysfunctions from the cultural to those that present themselves in, in more practical ways seem to have some common roots. And yet it's not obvious exactly how we should understand them given the facts that uh, Professor Pinker just laid out. When we think about those problems, we tend to imagine our society as a big open space filled with individuals. And one way to think about the problems people complain about is that these individuals are having trouble connecting. People feel lonely, people feel isolated, left behind. And so we talk about breaking down walls and building bridges and leveling playing fields, those kinds of metaphors. And I think that's important. But what we miss when we talk that way is that what's absent, what's causing us to perceive our situation in the way we tend to is not just, is not just that we need greater connectedness, but that we're missing something like a structure of social life, <clears throat> a way to give shape and purpose and concrete meaning and identity to the things that we do together, not just as individuals, but as groups of people. And I would say that if American life is a big open space, or if we can think of it that way, it's not just a space that's filled with individuals, but also a space filled with these structures of social life, with institutions. And if we're, if we're failing now to foster belonging, to foster legitimacy and trust, despite all the ways in which life is empirically getting better, then we're confronting something like a failure of institutions in American life. Um, and the, 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 the social crisis that we're witnessing is in many respects a crisis of institutions. We see that in some familiar ways. We, we're all, we all, I think, know the kind of cliche that Americans are losing trust in institutions, public and private and uh, a, a civic and political and educational. But I don't think we think enough about just what it means to say we're losing trust in institutions. You, you have to begin from the fact that every important institution in American life performs some crucial task for our society. Maybe it educates the rising generation, or it serves the poor, or it just provides some service, meets some need. And it does that by establishing a, a structure and a process, what I would describe as a form 
for combining people's efforts and work toward achieving that goal. And as it does so, every functional institution also forms the people in it to do that work in a way that's responsible and reliable. It shapes their behavior, it shapes their character, it forms them somehow. It fosters some kind of ethic around what the institution does. And ultimately, we trust an institution when we take it to form people in a trustworthy way, to form people who we can trust. And we lose trust in an institution when we, when we have a sense that it fails in that basic ethical purpose, that it doesn't form people we can trust. Uh, you know, one way that can happen is just corruption. That's a very familiar kind of institutional deformation. And we certainly see that now, but we see that always. And I would actually say there's less corruption. Certainly in our politics, there's much less corruption than there used to be for all that we complain about it. Um, incompetence is another reason why we might lose trust in institutions. Sometimes they don't do their jobs very well. And that happens now too, but a lot of our institutions are actually quite competent in historical, uh, in historical terms. But in some ways, what stands out about this moment in particular is a distinct kind of institutional failure or dereliction, which is not just a failure to form trustworthy people, but a failure to even try to form trustworthy people and a tendency instead for all of us to think of institutions not as molds of behavior and character, but as platforms for performance, for prominence. So that in one area after another in American life, we find people who should be formed by institutions, instead using them as platforms for themselves to build a bigger following, to advance their own prominence, rather than to be shaped by the institution into a teacher, into a member of Congress, uh, into a CEO or, or, or a professional. Uh, we see that obviously in our politics, a lot of people involved in the institutions of our politics are using them as platforms for kind of performance art. But you see it sometimes in the academy, you see it sometimes in corporate America, you see it in American religion, where institutions that are meant to shape people instead are used basically as platforms for, for political cultural performance. And that makes it extremely hard for us to trust our institutions. And along the way, therefore, it makes people feel as though those institutions are not there for them. They're not there uh, to serve them, to help them, to call them in. And people feel alienated from core American institutions. They feel like these are there for other people, for elites or whatever other term we wanna to use to describe people who seem to have power and who seem to have prominence and authority. And a lot of Americans feel like they are left out of that. And so have the sense that our society is not working for them, even though it is true that in a lot of important ways, our society is very functional. Life has gotten a lot better. Um, the, the, the sense that people have that leads to isolation, alienation, even to higher suicide rates and opioid abuse, these things are connected around a sense that our institutions are failing. And to address them, to answer them, we need to, to recover some path to institutional responsibility and to, and to belonging uh, and affiliation and trust. And so the challenge of building trust it's not unconnected to the empirical realities that Professor Pinker laid out for us, um, but it, nonetheless, the sense people have that things are getting worse is not an illusion. Oftentimes it's expressed as a denial of the facts, the realities that, uh, that Professor Pinker laid out. And there's a lot of denial in our society and a lot of conspiracism and a lot of people living with claims that are not facts and that has to be answered. But there also is an underlying reality to the sense that we are more isolated, that some of the institutional frameworks that have brought people together in the past have broken down. And we have to think about how to build those up by thinking about how to reclaim and recover some affiliation with core institutions in our lives, from families and communities, uh, churches and schools and universities, to our workplace, to our political system, institutions that help us feel like we're part of something larger than ourselves. I think the challenge we face now in American life is to help people recover a sense of belonging by restoring the, the capacity of these institutions to build trust uh, and to build confidence. And so a lot of the work that confronts us now is work that requires us to really understand what institutions are, what they do. And so some of my work tries to surface these ideas to provide a vocabulary that can help us see why even though in a lot of ways that are measurable in terms of individual well-being, health and wealth and so on, 
things have gotten a lot better, there is a lot of work to do for us to feel as though we're part of a healthy society. And in that sense, I don't think there's necessarily a contradiction between that view and Professor Pinker's view, but it's possible for our country to be getting better and worse at the same time. In fact, I think America is always getting, and every country is always getting better and worse at the same time. And we have to see and be grateful for what's better, but we also have to see and take action about what's worse. And there's always work to be done. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. I was gonna, (laughs) yes, jazz hands. I was gonna ask, yeah, what do you think about, tell us your your response. a lot, uh, a lot that I agree with. Most, most of what you've all said, I completely agree with. One is, and this is a f- frequently asked question that I get when I talk about statistics of global improvement and people point to various pathologies in the United States. And uh, an important thing to remember is, uh, for Americans to remember is, we're not number one. Uh, when it comes to just about any measure of human well-being, we're, you know, we're not as bad as Somalia or Democratic Republic of the Congo, but we underperform our affluent democratic peers in, in, in uh, suicide, in happiness, in um, academic performance, in drug overdoses, in teenage pregnancy, you name it, we're, uh, we, we uh, punch below our wealth in ter- considering that we have a much higher GDP per capita than they do, and we just don't, don't do as well. Uh, and this includes some of the trends. So it is true that American suicide rates have climbed since their low point in the, in the late 90s, but this is not a global phenomenon. Globally, suicide rates have gone down by a lot, by about 40% over the last 30 years, including amazingly through the years of the, uh, the two years of the pandemic, when you might have thought that suicide would go up and globally it's uh, gone down in more countries than, it's, than uh, it's gone up. Most countries, it hasn't changed at all. But the United States, uh, for, for decades, the suicide rate has crept upward. Um, it's also, uh, I also completely agree with, with uh, Yuval that uh, institutions play a critical role in human well-being. And this particularly came, uh, became clear to me when I tried to resolve a paradox in my most recent book, Rationality, of why on the one hand our species seems to be achieving new heights of, of rationality. We're exploring the planets again. We developed uh, vaccines for COVID in less than a year. Uh, in uh, domain after domain, uh, we are achieving new feats of, of intelligence and rationality, but you've got this you know, seeming pandemic of conspiracy theories and paranormal woo-woo and quack cures. And how do we, uh, and my own field, cognitive psychology, has famously documented all the ways in which humans are prone to various biases and fallacies. Anyone who's read Daniel Kahneman's bestseller, Thinking Fast and Slow, is familiar with them. So how do you reconcile this paradox? And and the main answer is institutions. Institutions like universities, a free press, government agencies, in, um, in which uh, people, uh, one person can point out the flaws in another's thinking, and so the community can be more rational than any individual could uh, could possibly hope to be. It's a, a theme that was brilliantly made by Jonathan Rauch in his recent book, The Constitution of Knowledge. This is true not just for rationality, but also for uh, safety and peace and health and and uh, and so on. So. The health of our institutions, I think, is a, uh, a, a, a critical component of human progress. It also resolves a, a tension that both Yuval and I have explored in, in, uh, in, in past books, namely, how does a inherently limited and flawed human nature, something that I have argued for very strongly, coexist with the undeniable facts of progress? And again, it's not because human na- humans are perfectible. It's not because we've uh, bred a superior human, it's because our institutions now and again do succeed in bringing about peace and order and knowledge and um, a truth, re- relatively speaking. So the health of our institutions is a concern. Um, it, trust in institutions certainly has been decreasing, but although it should be added from a high point in the 60s, and this is not as often appreciated, it's a point made by John Mueller, that uh, Probably the default in most societies is not to trust institutions. Something went right up through the 60s, and it has been declining uh, ever since. 
Uh, you've all pointed to some of the, the factors such as uh, corruption. But I think another factor is the relentless negativity of our journalistic culture, which exposes you know, one fail after another and often fails to notice ways in which institutions actually uh, you know, uh, haven't always screwed up. You know, poverty has gone down uh, when, when measured properly. Pollution has gone down. Accidental deaths have gone down. Uh, and uh, in, in many ways, our institutions, considering that they're built out of the, the crooked timber of humanity, a point that you've all and I uh, agree on, uh, we ought to be aware of ways in which our institutions don't always uh, suck. Sometimes they actually have achieved successes. You know, April, I want to stress a, a particularly important point, I think, that, uh, that's, that Stephen just made. And that has to do with the peculiar uh, character of American life, and in some ways of, of the West in general, in the post-World War II decades that we so often use as a default or as a measuring stick for this moment. That period, the 1950s to the middle of the 60s, was very unusual. Um, and not only in terms of trust in institutions, though that was very unusual, extremely high levels of trust, I think in some ways much too high um, in that it kept some of our critical institutions from really functioning. Um, it, it, it was also the case that the United States had what we would describe now as extremely high levels of social solidarity um, and a sense built on not only uh, a common experience of war, but also the mobilization of the depression, um, built on a sense that uh, Americans were in things together. We also had, as a practical matter, much lower inequality than we had before and after that period. Um, and those decades were not normal. Um, some of the some of the negativity that Stephen mentions, I think, is a function of, frankly, people who grew up in those decades, uh, who still, as you may have noticed, run all the institutions in American life, um, treating that time as a norm. And I think if you had looked in on America, say, at any point in the 19th century, um, even putting aside the 1860s, which were obviously different from for Civil War reasons, any other point in the, in, the, in the 19th century, you would have found a country with very low confidence in its institutions, with very profound divisions, a polarized politics, a lot of negativity. Um, and nonetheless, through that period, the United States industrialized and, uh, and expanded the capacity of many of its institutions, um, built up essentially every sector of its economy um, and became a global power. And so there is often a kind of disconnect between how our institutions are actually functioning and the public's attitudes about them. I think it's very important for us to see that the, the post-war era, the post-World War II era, not only was abnormal, it also had its own problems. If you look at the culture of the 1950s and early 60s, it's a culture that is screaming for liberation from conformity. And conformity is actually just another way to say social solidarity. Um, Right, there are good things about every force in American life telling you to be like everybody else, but there are also really bad things about that. Uh, the constraints on individual freedom and on, on diversity and distinct capacities. And the culture of that time, left and right, this was not just a, uh, you know, a kind of hippie sentiment. If you read the, the opening editorial of National Review from 1955, which if we know it at all, we know it for saying that the, the magazine would stand athwart history yelling stuff. The rest of what it said was an attack on conformity, which would have been almost at home you know, in the nation in those years. Um, and if, if, if you look at a kind of average Sunday sermon that Martin Luther King Jr. was giving in the 50s, before the height of the civil rights movement, a lot of them were about the dangers of bigness, the dangers of conformity. People were asking for liberation and then they got it. Our culture answered that call um, and enabled much greater diversity, much greater personal freedom, um, a lot more uh, economic liberty and a lot more personal liberty. And as a result of that, we also lost some of that social cohesion and social solidarity. It's the other side of the same coin. The other side of a coin that was very valuable and has done a lot of good for American life. So I think the fact that we face these problems means we should deal with them, but it doesn't mean that our society has been a failure. I think that period since the, since the middle of the 1960s 
has been a period of tremendous success in many ways. And especially for people who um, were not in the middle of the mainstream social consensus in that period, or who were minorities in other ways, life in America now is much better than it was in that period that people look to as a kind of golden age in the middle of the 20th century. And the fact that there's a price to be paid for that and that we have to live with, that we have to look for solutions to the problems it creates, well, it seems to me that's worth it. And it's, that, that just means that that's now our challenge, to find ways to rebuild social solidarity without giving up the best of what we have achieved through decades of liberalization, both economic and, and social. Um, and, you know, that's just what it means now to be an American dealing with the country's problems. I think it's well worthwhile. Yeah, so this is really interesting. Yes, absolutely. Whoever was giving jazz hands down there, Georgianne, yes, totally. Um, this is wonderful. And it's, uh, it's just like, just pleasurable to like hear you both like, um, just go like from statistic to statistic and sort of weave all of this together. And it frankly is sort of hope giving just because, um, gosh, it can all seem pretty bleak sometimes. And I think not just because of the news, although that certainly doesn't help. Um, I would like to ask, the uh so what is the uh, about the relationship between institutions and progress because if and if we think that all of this material progress has happened um there was uh, perhaps a high point of social cohesion and then institutions are have lost a lot of the trust of the american people and we need to get it back part of my question is what is the prognosis for that and um so keep that in mind the 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 place i want to go first though is steve you said something really interesting which was um that you think that as as you all does that uh, institutions are made of the crooked timber of humanity right uh, and you also said that you think that institutions make people more rational as a whole because people can correct each other's errors right and uh, i'm curious you mentioned at the beginning the phrase healthy wealthy and wise um Healthy, yes. Healthier, yes. Wealthier, yes. Wiser, I don't know. Um, and so my question is, do you think uh, that institutions make people more moral, more virtuous, um, or just more rational? And uh, if the answer is just rational, I'm curious to hear you talk about that, because I kind of wonder, uh, this isn't quite right, but I almost wonder if you're using the term rational in a similar way to the way that you've all you might use the term moral. There seems to be some good here that's that's captured. And if we both start from the crooked, the, the understanding that human nature is has some flaws. Um, yeah, I'm just curious about that. So healthy, wealthy, and wise. Yeah, Tell so me about I, that. I, spend, I, mean, I, I mean, I use that, uh, <clears throat> that, that handy mnemonic for the three main measures of uh, well-being. And by wise, I, I, I was literally just referring to literate and, and educated years mm -hmm. of education, not necessarily you know, sagacious or, uh, or, <laughs> sure. or, or wise in the, in the moral sense. Um, but uh, institutions, and also I should clarify, it's not just any old institution, because institutions can also breed groupthink and, uh, and, and extremism, you know, as we know with institutions like uh, the ones that, that took over in, in uh, Europe in the 1930s, not not, not, not such a happy outcome. The institutions have to be one, it, when it, at least when it comes to rationality, that have some overarching commitment to, to truth as an ideal or, or, or to other values that we can uh, defend and that put into place uh, rules of engagement that are explicitly designed to make the collective more uh, rational, more truth-oriented than its individuals can hope to be. And by, by that, I mean rules like, um, free speech, freedom of the press, freedom of inquiry, uh, checks and balances in democratic government, um, the, the, the right of, of, of rebuttal and the right of reply. Uh, so these aren't just any old rules, but they're, they're rules that at various times in history, the, the scientific revolution, the American revolution, have been implemented by, yes, wise people, taking note of the infirmities in, in human reason and morality, figuring out ways in which the whole can be more rational than, than uh, the parts. Even in the, uh, recently in the online realm, you can compare on the one hand, say, Twitter, and the other hand, Wikipedia. And Wikipedia, against all expectations, including mine, turns out to be you know, surprisingly good. 
Uh, it's got a track record <laughs> that is comparable to Britannica. Uh, if you would have described Wikipedia to me 20 years ago, I would have said, this, this can't work. This is a recipe for disaster. Somehow it did work. Why did it work? Well, because it wasn't a, um, it wasn't a free for all. It, there were overarching principles like uh, viewpoint neutrality, requirement to cite sources, uh, the ability to, uh, of a community to correct whatever good luck led their, uh, to, to coalesce a community of people who were committed to, to truth and objectivity. Somehow it worked, whereas as we know all too well, you know, Twitter and Facebook, uh, not, not so much. So, and, and a crucial question for those of us who want to promote the health of institutions is what are the rules of engagement that lead institutions to bring out our, our, uh, our better angels as opposed to enabling our inner demons? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it sounds like in your theory of institutions, there is something to bringing out people's better, uh, better angels, not just sort of their more truth oriented selves, but also perhaps their more benevolent, good hearted selves. Um, well, Yuval, so, yeah, go ahead. Uh, certainly, I'll just add, certainly to, to, to repress their violent selves and, and successfully <laughs> functioning uh, institutions are ones that uh, tamp down on, say, people's urge for dominance and revenge. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so Yuval, you've spent a, a good deal of time studying institutions. And so I'd like uh, to, to pose Steve's question to you. What makes them, what makes, what characterizes institutions that are particularly good? And sort of folded in with that, I, uh, the Braver Angels has a strong partnership with Bridge USA on college debates. Bridge USA is a, a group across campuses that runs, uh, that basically brings red and blue together along uh, within college students. And um, the head of that, Manu Mil, said to me recently, you know, my generation is intensely disaffected from institutions because the four main events of our sort of politically conscious life were all institutional failures. It was the um, 2008 financial crisis, excuse me, uh, September 11th, the 2008 financial crisis, the 2016 election and, and everything that is 2020. And so I'm curious, what characterizes institutions uh, that, that, that really can form people in a good way? And how will we ever get a generation that is reflexively um, mistrustful of institutions to buy back in? Well, let me, let me say a couple of things. I, 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 uh, maybe I, I'd, I'd offer a couple of layers in that answer. I, I'm a political scientist, and I tend to think about this question by beginning from the preconditions for a free society. I, I think it's crazy to say that the experience of young Americans today is fundamentally a function of failures of institutions. The experience of young Americans today is to live in a free society that is extremely prosperous, that provides them with extraordinary opportunities, that is committed to improving itself in a continuous way in, in the direction of moral improvement, social improvement, material improvement, those things didn't just happen. They're, those are not the background. And then you say, well, these four things went wrong. And so all our institutions are broken. Um, the, the trouble is when institutions succeed, they're often invisible. And that's especially true for our political institutions because their job is to provide us with a background social peace that lets us then pursue other goods in a, in a very diverse array of ways. Um, and so th th that's by way of getting to your question, which is I would say the, the way in which our political institutions in particular can serve the advancement of moral goods, given the enormous diversity of our society, including moral diversity, is by providing a background social peace that lets different communities and different people pursue the good in different ways at the same time. That's extremely difficult to do. Almost no society in human history has ever done that successfully. And our society, and now actually quite a lot of societies around the world, routinely do that pretty successfully. It's true that we, we sometimes fail and we notice those failures, but most of the time, I mean, you know, I'm, I, look, I'm Jewish. I'm, I'm two generations removed from people who had to escape Central Europe because they were being chased out by a government that was intent on killing all of them. Um, th that's not the case now. And it's not the case in our society. It's not the case in Central Europe. There's been enormous progress over that time, 
which is which has occurred through the functioning of political institutions aimed at social peace. And I think the the the, the American constitutional system in particular is geared to the advancement of social peace to a degree that we really ought to appreciate. Um, the institutions are there to provide people with choice, with, with, with democratic majority rule, and yet at the same time to protect minorities from abuses of power. This is very hard to do at the same time, right? We have elections, but we also have the Bill of Rights that says, I don't care what happens in elections, nobody's gonna make you, uh, you know, nobody's gonna take away your religious liberty and your freedom of speech. To say those two things at the same time is, is complicated. To sustain that at the same time requires a very complex system that is both majoritarian and counter-majoritarian. And some people like one piece of it and some people like the other, but it's the balance of them that allows us to have a society uh, that maintains this extraordinary balance where you know we can worship in different places, we can have a different idea of what our children should be taught uh, and a different sense of what it means uh, to be a good person. And yet we also live together and we work together and we, we are Americans together in very meaningful ways. That is the, the result of an extraordinary array of institutional successes. Um, it helps us see why we need functional institutions, but it should also show us that a lot of our institutions are really quite functional. I think that's what I would say to those younger Americans who who think, well, it's never been worse, uh, you know, w w the financial crisis and, and COVID. Well, I don't know. Talk to your grandparents, talk to their grandparents. Um, it, you know, it, there are, there's a lot to be grateful for. I'd start there. Secondly, I, I, I think that our institutions have an enormous role to play in shaping people toward a moral good, towards some idea of human flourishing. A lot of those in a free society like ours, and especially in a diverse society like ours, are not political institutions, but they're formative institutions, family to begin with, first and foremost, but also uh, church and synagogue and mosque and so on, and schools um, and cultural institutions and civic institutions. They're each built around some idea of what it is to be a good person, and that are aimed at straightening a bit that crooked timber of humanity. That phrase, which comes from Kant, is really about the, the difficulty we face given the fact that each human being, and Kant puts this wonderfully, each human being begins in the same place as every human being has always started. We don't start where our parents did. It doesn't matter how much social progress our society has made, every generation has gotta be essentially formed from scratch. And that requires institutions of formation and education that are geared to that purpose and that understand that moral progress happens person by person. Social progress can't be a substitute for individual moral progress. There are no shortcuts. And so we do need functional institutions that can help every individual in our society move from what we are when we enter the world to a, a, a human being capable of exercising the rights and privileges of a, of a free person. Um, that's an extraordinarily difficult undertaking. And without functional institutions that are directed to that important purpose, they can't function. So I, I, th th that's long-winded and forgive me, but I, I, think it's a, I think those layers of the answer are necessary because different institutions perform distinctly different functions. And one of the things that modern, uh, you know, broadly democratic societies have recognized is that there is, there is a way in which by, by containing and employing more knowledge than any individual could ever have, decentralized bottom-up institutions that allow for a competition of ideas, that allow for different views to be heard, can allow societies to make extraordinary amounts of progress while also letting people be free. And I think that's just the great, you know, that's the great magical accomplishment of, of the modern world and we have to protect it. We have to sustain it. We can't take it for granted and say, well, but the financial crisis and think that therefore we should try authoritarianism. We've really got to recognize how much we have achieved and how much there is to preserve. Interesting. So um, <laughs> uh, I, to, in defense of, of, of young people, um, I say this because I'm about to, to <laughs> critique them again, but in defense of young people, I think the claim is less um, that we have it worse than any prior generation has had it, and more that these failings are a function of internal rot. And um, to that end, 
I, I want to sort of come back to the relationship between institutional uh, institutions and progress. And there is this sort of longstanding theory. So this is the way I'm going to I'm going to insult the young people. Sorry, Sasha. Um, the, uh, I'm sorry about that. The um, it so uh, complacency, right? right? There's this question of what happens when um, you have institutions that function really well, they well, recede into the background. And then um, there's, you know, people uh, become less grateful, they become less acknowledging, they, I think many young people would say, we're asking more of our institutions because our values have evolved uh, to represent things that our institutions, um, <laughs> in uh, with which our institutions fall woefully short. Um, but I guess my, my fundamental question is uh, about is progress, so Steve, Stephen Yuval says that institutions are formative, is progress in some sense deformative, right? Like does it provide exactly the opportunity for, um, for complacency, for uh, disintegration, and is that part of what we're seeing? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, you know, once again, I'm in, in uh... Uh, complete, perhaps surprising agreement with uh, with um, Yuval. Uh, one of the gifts of freedom that we seldom appreciate, one of the mixed gifts, is that it includes the freedom to screw up your life. Uh, mm -hmm. And when you have a society with un <laughs> unprecedented freedom, people are going to get into trouble, people are going to disagree, and uh, we have to realize that that's part of a devil's bargain that we have uh, adopted, a theme that, that you've all mentioned um, uh, early in his remarks. Uh, I want to add, though, that together with the, um, the historical perspective that you get by considering the world of, of two generations earlier, of my grandparents and, and Yuval's, the world of world war and uh, world wars and, and the, in, in my grandparents' case, the Russian Revolution, the Great Depression, the Holocaust, uh, even the lesser hardships of even my generation as a baby boomer should you know, give us some perspective about the uh, institutional failures of today, because there were plenty of institutional failures of the 60s and 70s. The war in Vietnam has got to be a huge one. Um, stagflation, that is double-digit inflation combined with double-digit unemployment, something that, uh, that, that has to be remembered when we think about the, the financial hardships of today. The uh, Cold War and the, um, the, the, the fear that there might be an all-out um, nuclear strike from the, the Soviet Union, the existence of communism in half of Europe and fascism in countries like um, uh, Spain and Portugal, which are thriving democracies today. Uh, the urban renewal projects of the 50s, which led to the, uh, the destruction of vibrant uh, areas of American cities, rivers that caught fire because they were so uh, polluted, uh, seniors that had to survive on uh, dog food that uh, we, we forget how um, poverty in old age has been decimated by, uh, by some of the great society programs. So the, you know, as Franklin Pierce Adams put it, the best explanation for the good old days is a bad memory. And things were in some ways catastrophic in the 30s and 40s. And there, there were some really bad moments in the 60s and 70s as well. Interesting. All right. Um... Yuval, if you have further comments on that, you can make them. Well, let me I just, just say wanna, on your, yeah. I, I think on your very interesting question about the relationship of progress and um, and, and institutions or, or progress and moral improvement, I, I do think there is a way that, that the kind of material progress that our society experiences um, comes often with disruptions that break down institutions, that displace people. Um, you know, the, the, the economists call this creative destruction, but it often doesn't feel creative to the people whose circumstances are being destroyed. And that's a reality. That's true. Um, the, the question is, does that mean that the process that enables progress is therefore fundamentally broken? I, I, I think what it means is that every society that enjoys that kind of progress, every modern 
market society equipped with science and technology um, ha faces the challenge of sustaining the preconditions for human flourishing. And it's true that those preconditions can sometimes be easier to sustain in, in circumstances of stability um, when things don't change. The trouble is in circumstances of stability, you don't have material progress. Um, and again, it's easy to, it's easy for us from a distance to say, well, that sounds great. Generation after generation, you live on the same farm, you know the land, you know the people, you have a stable community with a stable religion. I don't, I, I'm not saying that to downplay that. I think that that is genuinely uh, can be a source of, of, of tremendous uh, joy and, uh, and meaning and, uh, and, and allows for strong families and communities. But I doubt there are many people in modern urbanized technologically advanced societies who on net would actually take that trade. We should not understate the advancements that our technology and science and capitalism make possible. Um, we can't just take those for granted and assume that we can have the, you know, the Christian princes of the Middle Ages and also have modern medicine. In fact, you can't. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, is it worth the price? I think almost all of us, and I will say, I certainly think it is worth the price, but that price has to be confronted somehow. And that means that for our kind of society, there is a challenge of how do we sustain the capacity for human flourishing in this situation? Not how do we recover that situation? Uh, it's not a matter of rolling back things or turning back clocks, but given that we have this level of progress, of diversity, um, which I think is a good thing, um, and, and of material advancement. Given that, what's the work we need to do to also let people uh, educate their children the way they want to, live in the kinds of communities that they, that they find to be necessary for their own flourishing? Those are the challenges we face. I don't think it's right to think of those as, as backward-looking challenges. Those are new challenges. They're, they, they confront us in a way that they haven't always confronted human beings. I think they call for a certain kind of appreciation of the preconditions for thriving that are not material. You know, man does not live by bread alone. That's more important than ever for us to recognize. And so economic progress isn't everything, but it is something, right? Man does need bread. Um, and so you, you, can't, you can't ultimately treat this as an either or question. You have to treat it as a challenge of how do we lead good lives and raise good children and keep all that we can of the benefits and advantages of modern life? That's the question for a society like ours. Excellent. So um, I wanna, uh, in, in just a minute, we're gonna open up to Q and A. Uh, and so before we do, I wanna ask just sort of one uh, final question and it's it's building on exactly what you were just saying, Yuval. Uh, and it is, um, <laughs> by the way, I just wanna observe that you two have done a beautiful job of, of evading every contrast I've tried to draw between you by just both thinking the right things about human nature and about institutions and about all this stuff. And it's very impressive. And probably it's because you're both, um, yeah, uh, brilliant enough to, to actually see the nuances that enable the threading of those needles. Um, but I want to ask explicitly about religion. Um, it's, this is my last stab at, at trying to, to make you disagree with each other. Um, the so it is uh i don't i don't have statistics at my fingertips but my impression is that the religions that ask more of people are generally on the rise so pentecostalism um uh some of the more um uh well <laughs> jewish orthodox orthodox judaism is a little bit complicated because the birth rate is so much higher but in any case my impression is that um that people are uh in a when when people spend people have spent a lot of time in a society where there's a lot of wealth, and a lot of progress, and yet there seems to be something something happening on the meaning front um, that isn't quite working, and that is causing people to move towards what would, would in some cases be called more backwards or more traditional or more conservative or more whatever uh, religious traditions, and I just want to um, invite you both to sort of think on that out loud. Um, what does that have to do with all the things we've been talking about? And how do we, how do we understand it? And Yuval, we can start with you. Well, sure, I, I agree with you. And I think it is 
very much connected to what we've been talking about. I, I think it's true not just of religion, but in general, that those institutions that demand a lot of people are attractive right now. Um, it's counterintuitive, and I, I think that you see this particularly in some religious communities that say, well, people now, you know, expect choices and options and everything. So let's just give them a, let's just give them a lot of choices about, you know, when they can come to religious services and what it really means and keep, and, you know, it, it, do it your own way. The, the, the institution, the religious communities that do that tend to be the weakest now. And the strongest ones are those that say, these are the rules. And th this is what you have to do to be part of this community, or this is what God demands of you. Uh, and how you need to live. I, I think that that, that that tells us some important things about how people feel the downsides of this moment and the hunger that is left unsatiated by the kind of, uh, of liberal society that we have. Um, I would say in general that, and you see this in some ways in our politics too, where we're living in a time that alongside with the emphasis on individual liberty, which has been at the center, in some ways at the center of American politics forever, but especially uh, at the core of how both left and right have tried to approach the public for, for three generations. Now, alongside that emphasis on liberty, you see an emphasis on solidarity. Um, solidarity equally, I mean, I, I would say it can easily become ugly. On the right, it can look like nationalism. On the left, it can look like certain kinds of identity politics. But I think both of those are ways of trying to help people be part of something larger than themselves um, and have a certain kind of solidarity with one another. It feels to people like they are isolated and they're drawn to, they're drawn to institutions and to ways of life that demand something of them. Um, people want to be wanted. People don't just want to have their needs met. They want to be the way in which someone else's needs are met. That's hugely important to how we find meaning in life. And I certainly think that when it comes to religious observance and, and to religious affiliation, that means that in those institutions that really make demands that say, this isn't just, you know, a, 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 this isn't just a symbol that you, that you wear. This is a way of life. And it requires you to constrain yourself and put limits on yourself. Those are very attractive at the moment. I, I think that does suggest to us that there's a kind of hunger that isn't going to be simply satisfied uh, by, by liberalism, by small l liberalism, by, by choice. Um, people want something more than that, want to be a part of something more than that. I don't think that's in tension with the liberal character of our society. I mean, th this society has always been home to, to serious and stringent religious commitments and to strong and demanding religious communities. I think it's healthy that, um, that, that people are looking to those now, but it's important to recognize. And I think it is really part of, especially the, the kinds of, uh, of unmet desires that younger Americans feel. People are drawn to, uh, to, to, to callings that make demands on them. And you know that tells us something about the character of the human person. It does. Well, Steve, what would you add? Yeah, there are, there are two enormous trends when it comes to religion uh, worldwide and certainly in the United States. One of them is there's a huge, there is a, a big movement away from organized religion. The fastest growing uh, religious movement is no religion at all, the so-called nuns, not, not the ladies with the habits, but N-O-N-E, that is people who say they have no religion. Uh, combined with, April, the, the point that you raised that all over the world, religious people have a lot more unprotected sex. They have more babies. And so uh, the number of religious people is increasing, even though the people who make choices tend to move away from religion. Now, what, it, it is tr true, and this connects back to our discussion of institutions, that traditionally, especially in the United States, religion was one of the institutions that, um, that had a number of pro-social functions. It civilized uh, 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 young men, unruly men. It was a source of charity, of medical care, of, of uh, education. Many functions uh, have been taken over by the state, probably uh, to everyone's benefit because it is uh, nationwide as opposed to uh, community specific. But it does admittedly leave this uh, hole in terms of community level institutions that are pro-social, they give people a place to connect with other people, they give them a, a higher purpose. There have been, I, I'm connected with two communities that have 
tried to uh, deliver some of the advantages of religious institutions without the supernatural beliefs, the, the miracles, the hocus pocus, the scriptures, which, uh, which people just aren't going, are less and less are, are willing to swallow. Uh, the humanist uh, community tries to do that. I was married in a humanist uh, ceremony. Um, the, there's in, here in the Bay Area where I'm currently, there's the rationality community, which has, uh, tries to come up with rational rituals that satisfy that need. You know, uh, probably not as well as traditional religions have, but given that people will move away from religions, especially younger people, I think that the religions that demand something of someone are particularly appealing to parents who legitimately worry about their kids being um, sucked into um, social pathologies like like drugs and, and teenage sex and, and, and gangs, and for whom religion can form a, a kind of bulwark against that by uh, providing a community that young people can belong to. Unfortunately, when young people make their own choices, they often gravitate away from them. But a big challenge, and this goes back to the, the imperative that uh, Yuval and I have discussed of strengthening institutions is, what kind of institutions can give people a kind of uh, wholesome, altruistic um, structure, set of goals, but nonetheless can remain, uh, retain its appeal in an era in which people will insist on individual choice, choice of sexuality, choice of politics, and that is decoupled from the kind of scriptural and supernatural beliefs that are, are increasingly difficult to swallow in a scientifically sophisticated society. Yeah, right. Maybe I can say one more thing about yeah, this. Sure. I, I, I think mm -hmm. that one of the peculiar things about this moment in American life is the absence of a powerful uh, evangelizing movement among the young. Um, and I don't think that's going to last. I, I think we're going to think of this moment as, as at the time prior to some kind of next great awakening in America. And it's not going to look like the last generation of American Christianity, but it will be, it will be a form of American Christianity. I mean, I think it will, th th just given our society, it's, it, it will presumably be some kind of Protestant evangelism, but that is native to the 21st century um, that thinks rather differently about race and a few other important issues than the last generation of American evangel uh, evangelicals did, um, and that will speak very powerfully to young people. I think there's a hunger for justice on college campuses that is being answered in a way that is not adequate, and that ultimately there is going to be a kind of Christian movement in those worlds I, I just think the desire for it is so powerful that it's downright strange that it isn't happening. Um, something like the the way that you know that Billy Graham looked at all those men in suits and said, "You're looking for Jesus," um, and and those guys didn't think they were, but he was right. Um, I I really it, this is not I, I'm not offering empirical evidence here. I I, w I don't claim to have it, but my my sense of this moment is that it is a time of moral searching that is going to be answered by some kind of 21st century form of a pretty traditional religion. Um, and so my impression is that we're, uh, we're gonna think of this time as, as the moment before that, when all that should have been obvious to us, but of course nothing is obvious till it happens. Well, one possible, possible answer to that is the one offered by John McWhorter, which is that the, um, the great awakening uh, of the 19th century in the 21st century is the great awakening and that anti-racism is our, as McWhorter put it presciently, is our flawed new religion. Now, I don't know if that will actually have the same social function, but there are arguments that it is uh, uh, filling that, that gap of, of, of a moral crusade, uh, a, a doctrine, a set of enemies, uh, and so on. Yeah. This is fascinating. I, I do want to um, let the audience get a few questions in, but uh, but I love this. And um, maybe, you know, we may continue it through the questions. Um, all right. Uh, so I want to start with, uh, wow, we have quite a few questions here. Um, we will do our best, folks. We probably won't get to quite everyone, but we will try. Um, so let's start with Kay Halpern. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question. 
Oh, okay. Well, um, this is really a fantastic presentation. So many marvelous insights. Um, so my question is, um, Yuval, you talked about, um, you know, now we're in a period of less cohesion, um, less conformity, uh, more individual liberty. So if you and also Stephen could comment on the cancel culture, uh, which tries to um, uh, force conformity both um, and that exists, the cancel culture exists both on the right and on the left. And related to that, how um, social media, the, you know, our modern communications technology, how social media exacerbates social disintegration and the disintegration of shared reality. Thank you. All right, well, you first. Well, thank you. Those are two large and very good questions. Uh, I, 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 I guess I'd say a few things. I, I am very concerned about what you describe as cancel culture or the, the, the tendency in, uh, within certain kinds of intellectual communities to close out competing views, to keep out competing ideas. Um, you know, I think the competition of ideas is ultimately how progress of every kind happens. Um, and it's particularly a problem on university campuses because the, the purpose of the institution of the university is to pursue the truth. And the only way we have to do that is to allow the competition of ideas, to allow people to hear different arguments, consider different facts, test them out, uh, and, and see what ultimately points toward truth. To close that path, to make it impossible for people to hear competing views, strikes me, first of all, as a betrayal of the ethic of the university, but also as a real danger to the capacity of our society to improve itself. And I worry about that very much. I think that is a serious problem. Um, and, you know, the, the various forms it takes I, I think a lot of them are misguided efforts at a kind of social solidarity, at saying that's not who we are, this is who we are. But to do that by closing off uh, avenues for, for competing ideas is frankly dangerous. Um, and very often it's also unjust and unfair. Um, and I, I think it's an enormous, I think it's an enormous danger of this moment. You ask about social media. I mean, these things are obviously connected. Social media has turned out to be an extraordinary kind of, um, of, of conformity machine. Um, I, I have to tell you that, that I, I don't know about you, but it was not obvious to me um, when social media first began to emerge uh, toward the beginning of this century that that's what would happen. There was, when I, when I was a graduate student in political science um, in, at the end of the 1990s and the beginning of the 2000s, there was just tremendous optimism, almost utopianism about what the internet, there wasn't social media quite yet, but what the internet would mean for American democracy. Um, to look at some of these things now, uh, you know, it's embarrassing, but it, it wasn't obviously wrong. I mean, you know, it didn't strike anybody as just totally insane um, we have learned in, in, the, in the 20 years that have passed since then that it turns out that technology, while it sometimes has its own logic, ultimately allows people to do more of what they want to do. Um, and if people don't want to be great citizens, the Internet's not actually going to let them be great citizens. If, if what they want um, is to spread rumors and, uh, and prove that they belong to the right team, um, then, you know, social media is going to let them do that. And as it turns out, it's quite well adapted to letting them do that. I worry about it a lot, but I also think that we're only still learning to live in a world of social media and even the internet. We're in the first generation of it. Um, you know, in the first generation of human beings living in cities, there was a lot of disease, there was a lot of violence, and there were not a lot of benefits. But I, for one, am glad that we didn't give up on cities when it got that ugly. Uh, people learned how to make the most of the advantages that they could offer while dealing with some of the consequences. I think over time, there's reason to hope that that can happen with social media, but it will take rules and it will take adaptation. It will take trial and error. And we're certainly seeing a lot of error so far. 
Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't agree more, including the, um, the, the threat posed by cancel culture to the only mechanism that we have for approaching truth, namely uh, uh, open debate and, and ability to criticize. And ironically, as and again, as McWhorter put it, the uh, cancel culture has given us just the feature of religion that we least want, namely uh, the, the, the punishment of heretics. <laughs> That's the feature that's drawn out. Also echoing the, the Yuval's point about the, uh, uh, the, the optimism about the internet when it arose, uh, I, I remember when the big problem with media, the one pointed out by my former MIT colleague Noam Chomsky in the manufacture of consent, was that we had a media oligopoly that a small number of for-profit corporations controlled the airwaves, the major newspapers. Uh, there was the, the wisecrack that freedom of the press uh, belongs to, uh, freedom of the press uh, can only be enjoyed by uh, he who owns one. And at that time, the idea that you would democratize expression, anyone could be a publisher, uh, seemed like it would bring about a kind of epistemic utopia. But for the, the reasons that we have both mentioned, that turned out not to be the case. And we're coming to appreciate the mechanisms of fact checking and criticism and editing that, um, that social media lack. And again, echoing um, Yuval's point that often new technological innovations bring with them unforeseen disruptions that take time to then develop countermeasures against. The, um, the, the, the printing press, including the rotary press that led to affordable newspapers, opened up this wild west of fake news and disinformation and plagiarism and uh, uh, scurrilous uh, accusations in the 19th century. The newspapers were filled with reports of life on Mars and sea monsters uh, pulled up in fishing nets and um, uh, various kinds of monsters and uh, magicians in other countries until the newspapers got their act together in the uh, early decades of the 20th century and developed codes of ethics and fact checking and source verification and printing of uh, corrections in order to rein in this anarchy that had been loosed by the then new technology of the Rotary Press. Fascinating, thank you both. Um, so staying on this same kind of vein, I'd like to call on um, uh, someone who is at least by appearance, one of the much maligned young people in the, in the audience tonight, Daniel Coleman, go ahead. Hello, uh, my question is addressed to both the speakers. Um, do you think we can institutionalize counterculture ideas? Uh, what I mean by that is hippie values, uh, such as peace and love, by my estimation, seem to go hand in hand with humanism and progress. Uh, civil disobedience and litigation, as preached by people like Martin Luther King, uh, aren't necessarily tearing anything down, but rather seem like uh, rational humanist corrections against uh, tyranny and aging systems. But on the other hand, we have um, uh, like uh, the Ker Kerouacian or beat uh, and existentialist models of living life um, according to what you see as meaningful. And this idea that the world as we see it does not seem to, uh, does not have to be the way it is, uh, seems to go against uh, the idea of the social contract uh, and institutions. Uh, so my question is, how do you reconcile these contrasting ideas? Uh, is there any way we can integrate peace and love uh, into our institutions as well as our culture in a healthy manner? Thank you. All right, which of you wants to, to take that one? I'll, I'll take a stab. Uh, it's a, a great question. And as someone, as a, a boomer who, who lived through uh, the efflorescence of those values, to some extent, some of the, the, uh, the, the hippie values have become institutionalized. Not so much love, and, and I don't know if we need love, but, but certainly peace, where our, our uh, um, of many nations, again, the United States is a bit of an outlier, but the avoidance of war uh, in contrast to the older idea in which war was ennobling and um, altruistic and spiritual and holy. The idea that war is something that you avoid. It is not a, um, 
your, your first choice for advancing the interests of your country is one that has been incorporated into uh, most Western countries, not so much uh, Russia as we're, we're now seeing. Uh, likewise, racial tolerance, a, uh, a value of the, of the, the hippies is, is pretty much law of the land. Uh, civil disobedience almost by definition can't be institutionalized because then it wouldn't be disobedience. Um, but uh, perhaps an openness to continuous reform, uh, self-examination, um, fixing of flaws is something that ought to be part of any healthy uh, democracy or indeed institutions. Great. Yuval, what would you say? Well, maybe I can give you a kind of uh, world-weary Gen Xer answer to the same question. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I think that in a lot of ways, the, the adapting to social criticism or to criticism of itself is the hardest thing that any society can do. Um, and I do think that our society learned a lot from the critics that arose against it in the middle of the 20th century and changed itself in some important ways in response to what they had to say. Um, in the process, uh, as, as Steve says, their, their criticism becomes internalized, digested. It becomes part of the mainstream. It becomes part of the establishment. Um, there's no way around that. And I think it's a good thing that ultimately the, those, rather than the system saying, yes, the, the, you know, change was needed, I was wrong. The system says, well, that's what I meant all along. I take that to be a kind of success of the critics. Mm. I certainly think that, um, th th that civil disobedience, uh, you know, there, we can go back to Kant here. I mean, the, 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 categorical, the categorical imperative says you have to judge something based on the question, what if everybody did this? Um, I, I don't agree that that's how you judge everything. But civil disobedience couldn't be a universal practice. Um, you know, then you wouldn't have law. But there has to be room for disobedience that that forces a society to think about whether some of its laws are unjust. I think our society has done some of that in the last two generations. I'm sure there's more of it to be done. Um, but you know, on the whole, American society has done a decent job of internalizing criticisms and learning from critics. Um, and you know, all I can say is I. I since there's always, since there are always ways to improve, I hope we can keep doing that. To do that, there has to be room for those critics to exist and to speak up. And I, that does actually point us back in the direction of the danger of cancel culture and the danger of a kind of closing off of paths to criticism um, that make it very hard for us to hear from people who object to widely held views. And ultimately, that kind of thing, you know, although it can't be completely normalized, it has to be, there has to be room for it or else there can't be any progress. Very good. Um, so next we'll go to a question submitted by Mike Perzicki. Uh, Does a society have to have enemies to be cohesive and functional? Did 20th century America spoil itself by defeating fa fascism and communism so decisively? You know, I would add, is, and they're coming back to bite us. Go ahead. Yes. Th th this is a real challenging question for a communitarian like myself. Um, the challenge for communitarians, uh, and they exist on the left and the right. I'm a, I'm a conservative communitarian. There are a lot of liberal ones too. Wh when you get a bunch of us together, we'll talk about how successful the United States was at building community in the wake of World War II or the Depression or the civil war. There are examples of this after all kinds of disasters. And after all, you have to ask yourself, well, so what are, are we hoping for a disaster? Um, after which we might feel like we're a little bit more united. That pandemic, can't be right. Maybe, anyway. What, what's that? A, a pandemic maybe? A pandemic, anyway. well, it turns out, right? Not every disaster brings us together. Um, I, I, I certainly think it's true that there are ways that outside pressure um, brings people together. Uh, there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt it works that way. The challenge for us is to think about how we can bring people together without that kind of outside pressure, and especially without the pressure uh, of war and disaster. Um, th there is always a risk that social solidarity is achieved at the expense of an outside group, right? To say, this is who we are, is to say, that's not who we are. And it's very hard for that not to take the form of 
those people aren't us. Um, and you know, the, 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 that challenge always confronts every attempt at building social solidarity. And again, you see it in this moment, a moment that's so hungry for solidarity on both the left and the right, th that those efforts very often take the form of defining an outside group and saying, that's not who we are. Um, it, it's, it's hard to avoid it. I think ultimately in our kind of society, as big and diverse as it is, a partial solution to that is, is subsidiarity, is allowing communities to take different forms in different places so that they can be built around a kind of interpersonal connection where people actually see each other face to face and you're not, you're not unified around an abstraction but rather around some real concrete needs and forms of identity. Um, and in that way, when it's a little more local, when it's a little more interpersonal, it doesn't have to be defined against an enemy in the same way. It can be defined against a problem or a need um, or a commitment or a way of life. Now th that's, you know, that's easier said than done, but I think that that's the kind of solidarity we should be aiming for that ultimately solidarity on the level of a nation of 300 million people is likely only to be achieved in ways that we would not want. Um, but solidarity in communities is, is, is achievable in ways that are much more attractive than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've heard it said that uh, we need to be threatened by a Martian invasion for the nations of the world to come together in peace. Uh, actually, don't think that's, that's true. We have the, the, uh, the great reduction in interstate war over the last 70 years has occurred without a, uh, the threat of a Martian invasion, but of a recognition of the costs of war and the, the benefits of, of peace. Uh, and, and I tend not to think that we should, certainly we shouldn't count on external threats for um, uh, internal solidarity. Among other things, the, the ultimate threat, namely the, the, the fight against fascism during the Second World War, uh, resulted in, for example, the internment of Japanese Americans. It uh, certainly did not bring about the civil rights revolution that, 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 that only began uh, decades later. 9-11 was, uh, for a while, it seemed to be the external threat that would unite the country, and it briefly did, but then it led to the uh, ill-advised wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which divided the country, and um, uh, the, the George W. Bush years were ex uh, also extraordinarily um, divisive. So uh, to the extent that that happens, it's probably not the optimal way to bring a society together in comparison to ideals like trying to bring peace and prosperity and education and health to as many people as, as uh, possible. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, we'll now go to David Clowney. Good, now I'm unmuted. Uh, and uh, I have to cheat and start by thanking Steven Pinker for giving us such a wonderful, uh, uh, even better uh, substitute for the manual of style. <laughs> it's just it, it was amazingly good and i i recommend it all the time but but here here is i mean i've got a zillion questions i'm a retired philosophy professor you have to expect it and, and i'm not going to ask some of the biggest ones but um i as, as having taught at a university for 30 years and seeing the development of universities around the country uh, and i see a huge move in the universities uh uh, downplaying the humanities, most of them, not all, but most of them, uh, and, and emphasizing uh, what's called STEM, or occasionally they're sneaking art, usually uh, uh, the commercial varieties in and calling it STEAM. Uh, but, um, uh, and it seems to me uh, that, uh, you know, what Yuval said about uh, a university being a place where folks with different visions of the good can talk to each other and work out compromises and learn how to live with each other so they can go out and be citizens uh, in a liberal pluralist democracy that can't have a common vision of the good or it wouldn't be what it is. It just has to keep rolling along and compromising. Uh, the, you don't so your learn, question. There yeah. is. You, you, how, how does the university do that? They, they don't. Uh, it's, the, it's in the humanities where you, you start to get to work those things out. And if it's all going to be turning the universities into trade schools to, you know, for uh, employment, 
that matches the notion of progress we've heard of, but uh, how, do you, how do you accomplish that other thing that Yuval was talking about? Mm. What do you, th you, you've both been in that world. What do you guys think? Stephen, you want to start this time? Yeah, so I have, I have written about that pretty extensively in an article for the New Republic, and then again in a chapter in Enlightenment Now. And um, certainly the, uh, our, our societies and our universities disinvestment from the humanities is a, uh, a, a problem um, that uh, one wants a vigorous uh, culture of debate, erudition, scholarship, respect for the past, cultivation of beauty and, and uh, wisdom. Part of the problem though is, I, I think is self-inflicted that the humanities by going so strongly in a, toward postmodernism with its obscurity, its suffocating political correctness, its left-wing monoculture has turned off a lot of students and donors and, and, uh, and deans. So some of the trouble is self-inflicted. Another is uh, I think the hostility that many uh, scholars in the humanities have toward the sciences. Going back to C.P. Snow's uh, Two Cultures lectures and book, where any attempt to bridge the science in humanities and to have a, a consilience, the, the enlightenment ideal of a continuous landscape of knowledge is often met with utter vituperation. And I myself have been a victim of this, um, uh, not infrequently, in suggesting, for example, that uh, the science of perception and uh, of language has something could, could inform the study of art and, uh, and, and literature. That the discoveries of human nature from genetics and evolution and neuroscience and cognitive science could be woven into political philosophy. Uh, these ideas arouse a surprisingly vitriolic reaction from many of the champions of the uh, humanities in our uh, intellectual magazines like the New York Review of Books. Uh, and I think that kind of isolation of uh, the humanities from what could be a, a productive source of new ideas that could excite new generations of students is one of the reasons for the, at least the institutional decline of humanities in universities, which, which I think is uh, regrettable, but in part self-inflicted. All right, Eva. Well, I agree with that. I would also say that the humanities have a particular role to play in a society like ours, which is fundamentally a formative role. They're not just another set of academic disciplines where the work ought to be focused on the discipline. And so what you're doing is the pursuit, uh, the, is adding to the knowledge available to the discipline in the way that you would in many other academic fields. The humanities also has the task of forming students and citizens and there, the work really isn't exactly adding to the store of knowledge as much as it is uh, exposing the rising generation to society's store of knowledge. It's fundamentally about teaching in a way that even in some of the other academic disciplines where of course a lot of teaching happens, there the teaching is more directed to forming the next generation of professionals, of, of, of participants in the discipline. The humanities also have a role to play in forming the rising generation of citizens informing men and women who are going to be capable of being free people. And I think that means that the humanities aren't just one more option among the majors you can choose at a university, but that a great university would make sure to expose all of its students to some degree um, to, uh, to the best of what our civilization has to offer them. And I, I, I think that ethic is lacking. I mean, there are places where it can happen. It can happen alongside uh, a, a commitment to other disciplines and to STEM. I mean, I, you know, I, I got my PhD at the University of Chicago, which still today, certainly then, uh, was committed to this kind of ethic. The University of Chicago is mostly a STEM school. We don't think of it that way, maybe. But if you think about how it spends its money or how much of the campus is devoted to labs as opposed to uh, classrooms where you talk about Socrates, it is mostly a STEM school. But it has a commitment and sees itself as committed to exposing all of its students in some way, at some level, um, to what we would think of as the humanities. I think for a great university, that's extremely important. Wonderful. Very good. Okay. Um, let's now go to Rita Chisholm. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question. 
Thank you so much. And thank you both for being here tonight. This is really intriguing and so enlightening. Um, my question has to do with, I was never a very political person before Trump came to the stage. At that point, I didn't even get political until I actually lost a friendship over uh, my vote for Trump. Um, that being said, I've reflected a lot on a lot of what I've seen happen in, you know, between our uh, citizenry. And I was very, very disheartened when I first began to watch so much on TV. Um, one of the first things that happened was, a, for me myself, was a loss, we talked about it earlier, a loss of confidence in, in the institution. And that was watching um, the, the, the process and how ugly it was getting across the aisle. My question, though, has to do, and uh, Professor Pinker, you may be able to answer this. Uh, both of you could, but, you know, what I am seeing, and I understand that because I'm late to the stage of poli the, the political stage, there's a lot that I'm unaware of. But what I was watching and, and was seeing was such a hatred of one man, what seemed to be such a hatred of one man, that it it splintered our, you know, our nation. And my question is, is, does the hatred of a person, have we ever seen that before on the political stage where we were so divided over, you know, a figure, a, a political figure? Well, I, you know, I, I can remember, and, and again, um, uh, you know, my social circles, because I've been in academia, tend to, to run liberal, but both Richard Nixon, well, Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan and George, George W. Bush were tremendously hated in the, uh, the, the circles that, 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 uh, that I ran in. Um, probably, I th I, I, this is not to deny that, that probably the hatred of Trump was stronger even than those three villains. But on the other hand, you can hardly call Trump innocent in, in stoking that, uh, that war, given that unusually among Republican politicians, he was um, aggressive, demonizing, insulting, first with his Republican rivals in the primary process, but then the, the, uh, the stream of vitriol from his speeches and, and Twitter feed uh, was, it was quite extraordinary. So. Uh, there was an unusual amount of, of uh, hostility toward toward Trump, but he's hardly an innocent victim of, of it. May I may I follow that up with just asking something because I do understand. No, so, sorry, Rita. Oh, we just sorry. have. That's, so, okay. That's okay. That's no, okay. no, no. It's just because we have so many people. Sure. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yes, but I really appreciated your question, and Yuval, if you want to add anything, you're welcome to. No, I mean, I would just say I, I worked for George W. Bush as a White House staffer, and I remember the, the intensity with which he was hated. It, it struck me as very strange. It didn't really match the person I, I saw in front of me. Um, there was also very intense hatred for Barack Obama on the right uh, in the years that followed, which, again, there was a lot I disagreed with Barack Obama about, but a lot of what was said about him just did not seem to me to be related to the actual person who was, was uh, in the office of the presidency. I, I'm sure some of that happened with Donald Trump. I, you know, I had some friendships tested because I didn't vote for Donald Trump. Um, and I, I do think that um, he invited a lot of that criticism by the way in which he carried himself. But there's no question that the response to him also was evidence of, uh, of, of, a, of a kind of um, loss of perspective and loss of balance that a lot of us have suffered from in, in our politics in recent years. There's no way around it. All right. Um, Casey Fockler, you're up next. Go ahead and unmute. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I have two questions, if you don't mind, and I'll make it real you, quick. You can uh, make them one Stephen, question. But... Well, okay. Well, then let me let me just go to uh, my question here for Yuval and Stephen, you can uh, uh, chime in. Yuval, you had mentioned about uh, social solidarity and, you know, how church, family, schools, civic is the functional institutionality, which helps move that forward to building a good person. Um, my question is this, our founding fathers, 18th century politics, they were all concerned about a, a good government. Are we at a point where we can start calling our institution, our, our, our current government, a good government? 
that they can impart ways to make good people in our society. Well, you know, I think part of the part of the magic of our way of thinking about government is that we don't ultimately expect government to form people uh, on its own. What we expect from government mm -hmm. is uh, it, it, it is a protection of the preconditions for different people and different communities, especially to go about that work of formation in their own ways. Our government provides us with some background social peace. It also provides us with the institutions that we need to negotiate differences. Um, I do think our constitutional system is very well formed and adapted for that kind of work. It doesn't always do it effectively, but it often does. Um, and you know th that kind of negotiation, that kind of bargaining that lets us deal with public problems is a way of creating the space for the, the, the more directly formative institutions to function. Those look more like families, they look more like schools, they look more like churches, they look more like civic organizations. Again, they're more local, they're a little bit closer to the ground because I think that kind of formation happens person by person. We make, we make very great demands of our politics, the, the preservation of that kind of social peace and the enabling of bargaining and accommodation and negotiation is very hard. Um, but it isn't ultimately about the direct formation of individuals. Now, a regime like that shapes people, right? It forms people in certain kinds of liberal virtues, um, patience and tolerance um, and you know, civility, a way of living with difference that doesn't come naturally, that isn't just how human beings are. And I do think that our, our institutions form people to be reasonably good at those things, though we're, there are certainly ways in which we're failing now. Um, but I, I think that's the way in which good government relates to the formation of, uh, of better human beings in a free society like ours. This is not the only way to organize a society, but it sure seems to me uh, to be a functional way in a pretty good way, uh, especially in a very, very diverse society like ours. Thank you. Great. Um, it's, an, it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. What institutional rules of a government could foster the kind of pro-social uh, values and solidarity and community that, that we, we want to optimize. And my, this is an area where Yuval is much more of an expert than, than I am, but my impression is that the American founders were worried about uh, tyranny. They were worried about mob rule. Uh, I'm not sure how much attention they gave to the, the uh, Kind of promotion of community solidarity through the rules of government itself. And there are a number of ways in which one could point to aspects of the American political system now that seem perversely designed to divide us. Any kind of winner take all rule where it becomes, uh, you know, if you lose by uh, a, a fraction of a percentage point, then you are, uh, your voice is nullified. Things like the electoral college, lifetime tenure for Supreme Court justices, uh, congressional districts where it's um, a winner take all, first past the post voting where if you vote for uh, the, uh, anyone but the, the winning candidate, your vote is, is wasted as opposed to various kinds of proportional representation. Uh, it would be interesting to compare different governments to see which of their institutionalized rules lead to better outcomes in terms of um, community uh, comity. Now, of course, you know, Yuval comes from, from Israel. Israel has a, does not have the equivalent of con congressional districts, but um, and does not have winner take all uh, party voting, does have shifting coalitions. Not clear. Uh, whether that leads to a more harmonious or, or uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, pro-social society. It, at at the very least, it has its own problems. But, you know, yes. I would say that there are two categories there in the things listed. Uh, things like the Electoral College or uh, the lifetime tenure for judges, those really are ways ultimately of protecting minorities or the design of the Senate. Those are counter-majoritarian, certainly, but they're ways of making sure that narrow majorities don't push around durable minorities. I think the question of a proportional representation is quite different, or the, the ways in which we elect members of Congress are not laid out in the Constitution. There's, there's room for states to experiment with things like ranked choice voting, uh, with things like multi-member house districts. We've actually done both of those things in, in the course of our history um, in electing members of Congress. 
And I think there's room now to experiment with both of them and with other ways of thinking about that. Within the framework of the Constitution, we've sort of lost the knack for that kind of experimentation. We've done almost none of it for a century now. Uh, and we haven't expanded the House of Representatives for a century, which was the, the framers of the Constitution assumed that would happen every 10 years after the census. And it did until 1910. Um, I think there are all kinds of ways in which we don't have to be quite stuck in the rut that we're stuck in. Even within, even without changing the Constitution, there's a fair amount we could do if we're not happy with how our system is functioning. Really interesting. Thank you, um, both of you. Uh, let's go to Ross Collier. Go ahead and unmute. All right. Thank you all for uh, this and your work. Um, on cancel culture, I want to ask, um, as soon as I find it, um, does truth always win in a free and open debate? And if it doesn't, what are the consequences? Thank you. All right, um, Stephen. Yeah, no, it certainly doesn't. There's no guarantee that it will. You know, demagogues can carry the day. They're, they're debating tricks and uh, uh, various ways of, of um, bamboozling uh, a, a community. Um, but I think it is fair to say that um, uh, autocracy and censorship is almost guaranteed to lead to falsehood simply because no single human is infallible or omniscient. And so our only hope is not just uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, but some commitment to procedures and, and rules of the game that, uh, that, that will um, orient the community toward truth. Things like empirical testing, um, uh, open criticism, and a, a joint commitment that to change your mind when the evidence changes. Mm. Well, you can add something if you like. Well, I, I would just say, I, I think there's always a balance to strike between truth and peace when we think about a free society. And those are both extremely important. Um, our debates don't always end in truth because our debates are, our political debates at least, are not always about empirical questions. They're about how we want to live. Um, and that means that there are a lot of circumstances where arriving at a compromise, at a durable bargain that lets us make some progress without being at each other's throats um, is worth more than arriving at the perfect policy solution to the problem. Um, and so uh, uh, arriving at a solution that doesn't require us to be at war with each other is worth a lot. It's worth a lot in the price is often paid in bad policy. I mean, democratic governance can be very inefficient. But when you think about the alternative, you know, China's very efficient, but I don't think you want to live there. Um, and so the, 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 the virtues of freedom are not just about the search for truth. They're also about enabling people to live in ways that allow for thriving and flourishing. And I think that's very important. Absolutely. Um, let's go to Victoria Hutter. Go ahead and unmute. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm her husband. That's my question. Great. Uh, is there an anti-capitalism mindset in the country rather than a reformation of capitalism? If so, what are the possible consequences? And implications. And implications. Yeah. All right. You know, I well, think there are a lot of people in our country who think they're anti-capitalist. Um, I think there are fewer people who actually are anti-capitalist. Um, <laughs> You know, there, there, there's certainly people who talk about something like, uh, you know, Scandinavian social democracy and call it socialism, but they still want to have lots of options at the supermarket um, and would be very, very dissatisfied if they didn't. So I, I actually think the commitment, broadly speaking, to the market economy is pretty sturdy in American life. Now, I think a lot of the people who, um, you know, I, 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 I think our economy is actually better in most ways than the Scandinavian social democracy, and I would defend it, but I don't think I'm actually defending it from socialists. Um, and so a lot of what goes by the name of anti-capitalism, you know, our politics is fought within the 40 yard lines and um, to be a very comfortable middle-class American at an elite university and say you hate capitalism, you know, you'll forgive me if I, if I doubt it. 
I, I put it slightly differently. I, I agree that everyone wants the benefits of capitalism, such as massive consumer ch choice and, and affluence. Although I think if you asked a lot of people, and I, I, I don't know the exact data, but I think there's a pretty strong generational effect that even the, the opposition of capital to capitalism, at least the expressed opposition to capitalism itself, as opposed to its gifts, uh, has probably gotten stronger in the last uh, couple of decades and, and in, in uh, younger generations. Um, but the disconnect between the, um, the, the outcome of capitalism and the actual nature of capitalism, it goes both ways because many of the staunch defenders of uh, capitalism and it's what opponents of capitalism think capitalism is a kind of anarcho capitalism with no regulation or social safety net or redistribution uh, just doesn't exist. There's no such thing as an affluent uh, capitalist society without a pretty extensive welfare state and regulatory state. And that includes the United States. So there is a range. France redistributes about 30% of its income uh, of its uh, GDP, United States about 20%. But as you've all said, it's all in practice, it's all within a, uh, a pretty narrow band. There are societies that are not capitalist, like, like uh, uh, the, the former communist countries, North Korea, Venezuela, and so on. But the capitalist countries are all uh, social democracies. We probably would have fewer polarized debates if that was recognized on both sides that when we talk about capitalism, we really are talking about a market uh, with um, redistribution and regulation. And not only is there a lot more redistribution than people realize in the United States, but there's a lot more of a free market in Scandinavia than, than uh, people realize. So it really uh, is not socialist by the classical definition. Mm. Uh, Georgianne, you get the award for best jazz hands tonight, and I'd love to hear your question. <laughs> yep, go, ahead, go for it. Well, if I can still find it after listening to all this wonderful um, information. Um, but, you know, I'm coming from a spiritual perspective. Um, I've meditated for uh, since I was 28 years old, so that's like a long time. Um, <laughs> And I'm just wondering if you guys are aware of this, a sort of a grassroots um, movement um, towards more people, more and more and more people really taking their own spirituality aside from or with a church um, very seriously. So in other words, it's the old Christian idea that Christ is within, not not in the church, you know, he's not in that guy there, and the priest, he's within. And so I'm wondering if you, if you fellows have um, uh, read any of Richard Rohr's writing on, um, uh, he, he has the Center for Action and Contemplation. So contemplation meaning bringing that uh, sort of peace and love dimension that our young man was talking about earlier into reality, into the actual functioning of a human being connected with other human beings um, who are on the same path. All right. Mm -hmm. Enlightenment. Are you guys aware of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, comments on, on that. Uh, Stephen? Well, let's see. Um, the uh, you know, I would distinguish um, spirituality and enlightenment in the senses of, say, being more aware of your own uh, experience and how it relates to something that is greater than than yourself, to humanity, to the universe, to the truths of logic and and morality that are not just products of our own um, uh, psychology. Uh, from uh, kind of paranormal woo-woo and belief in synchronicity and spiritual energy and spiritual healing uh, and so on. The former being, uh, you know, I would say a good thing, the latter, not so good. Um, and it, it is also true that despite the decline of 
uh, affiliation with organized religion in the United States, there has not been a de commensurate decline. In fact, there may have been even be a compensatory increase in openness to various forms of, of uh, paranormal and uh, spiritual uh, woo-woo. That uh, to my disappointment, because I like to plot trends in uh, progress, uh, I had hoped to see that polling data revealed a decline in belief in astrology, for example, or uh, reincarnation or haunted houses and spiritual energy and, and crystals. Uh, to my intense disappointment, uh, I don't see such a decline in, in the polling data that I, I've looked at. All right, you all. Yeah, I don't know what I, what I have to add. I guess I would say that um, th there definitely has been a kind of disestablishment of religion in people's lives, a sense that even people who continue to believe, and in fact, the numbers of Americans who say that they believe in God has not changed all that much um, the, the numbers of Americans who say that they're part of a religious community or a church has changed dramatically. Um, David Campbell at Notre Dame has done some great work on how to make sense of that and what it actually, what people mean when they say that. And some of them certainly mean something more like spirituality uh, than, than traditional religion. It, it, ultimately, his conclusion is that people take themselves still to be traditional believers, but that they're not happy with the communal forms and the institutional forms that, uh, th th that their traditional religions take, and they have a kind of individualist take on this. Um, I, you know, I, I, I suspect that there are going to turn out to be generational differences um, in how people live that out. Um, you know, if you're raised in a traditional church, you can say as an adult, I'm not part of that church anymore, but still have a pretty clear idea of what it means um, to be a Christian, say. But if you're not, if you're that person's ch child, then uh, you, your connection to those traditions is much further worn down. And I think what people mean by religion uh, ultimately changes generationally as Americans become less and less members of traditional religious communities and uh, where that goes is an open question. All right. Um, so we are coming close to the end of our time. Uh, David Lindenfeld. And so I'm going to encourage brief questions and brief answers. Go ahead. Okay. I'd like to ask both speakers how they would factor climate change into their analyses. Uh, seems to me that it is profoundly disruptive and will be on such a scale as unprecedented which could easily swamp the institutions that we have trust in and undermine it. And I just wonder what your response is to that. Yeah, well, it, it could, uh, and we should uh, try to prevent that from happening. I, I do have a discussion of climate change and enlightenment now in which I basically argue for a combination of policy changes, particularly carbon pricing um, and technological changes not excluding nuclear power, but including uh, especially fourth generation, but ways of making clean energy cheaper than dirty energy so that people following their own self-interest will opt for what's best for the planet. And that, I think, I, I believe that technological innovation is our best hope for a soft landing from the, uh, the climate crisis. All right, Yuval? I, I... I incline to think about that in a broadly similar way. I think climate change is a manageable problem. It's just the kind of problem that our society has particular trouble with because it's not immediate, but it's also not a thousand years away. And that's, that's exactly the blind spot we face when we think about where to deploy our resources now. It's not a problem that will show itself before the next election. There are other problems that will, and there's a tendency to focus on those and in the meantime, this problem grows. I think the same way about, for example, the federal government's fiscal problems, which are very real. They're math. They're undeniable. And yet they're not going to hit us hard in the next five years. And so no one has an incentive to focus on them right now. The longer we wait, the harder it is to deal with them. But we can deal with them. They're within our power uh, to develop solutions for. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not hopeless about it, but I think our politics is distinctly unsuited to dealing with that kind of problem in particular. All right, and um, I'm at risk of going just slightly over. We're gonna take one final question. Um, Mats and Duncan, uh, I just would ask that you keep your question very, very concise, but you may have the last word. 
Thank you. Yeah, I'm doing armchair research in a, in the, on this very topic of social institutional progress for a TEDx talk I'm pitching. So my question is, uh, it has been my assumption that thought leaders like John Berbeke and Daniel Schmachtenberger are onto something, and that is the Western world is experiencing a, a sense-making and meaning-making crisis. Is there, uh, is, do, do you notice that? Uh, is there, and is there some lack of social accountability and responsibility in the Western world? Right. Well, I certainly agree with that. I, I, I guess if I, if I am to be brief, I can point you to my last book and apologize for answering the question that way. But I, I, I very much think in similar terms, and I think that it has to do particularly with a change in how we understand the responsibilities of our institutions and the people who lead them. Um, and I do think that ultimately <coughs> leads to uh, a kind of crisis. I don't think it's the end of the world. I think we can recover from it. And that part of what it would take to recover from it is to surface an understanding of this problem and a vocabulary for seeing it this way. And to my mind, that means especially the vocabulary of institutionalism, which doesn't come naturally to us and which we would do well to think about explicitly. All right. And uh, Professor Pinker. Well, I guess I'll, I'll also answer it by pointing to a, a longer answer that I have put together elsewhere, my, my book Enlightenment Now, um, tries to suggest that there, there uh, is a source of meaning that we all acknowledge, but perhaps like the, the gentleman who was delighted to learn that he'd been speaking prose all his life, um, have uh, tended to ne neglect, and those are the values of the Enlightenment, which I would identify as reason, science, and humanism, namely uh, trying to figure out how the world works in service of enhancing human flourishing. That, that, uh, that ought to be our source of meaning, whether or not it, uh, uh, it is, it, I make the argument that it should be. All right, very good. Well, um, I just want to uh, thank you both deeply for one of the most, uh, and here's your word, John, erudite conversations I think we've ever had at Braver Angels. And uh, just my goodness, the, the nuances and the weavings together and divergences throughout have been absolutely fascinating. And I, yeah, I am really grateful to have been able to be part of this. Um, and uh, for your, your, your send off, I'm going to pass back to <laughs> um, the third most perhaps erudite gentleman on the call tonight, uh, John Wood Jr. Well, thank you very much, April. And you forgot, of course, that Luke Phillips is on the line and many other folks, perhaps more erudite than myself. But uh, Stephen, Yuval, thank you so much, not just for being here tonight, but, be, for, but for being friends of, of Braver Angels, mm -hmm. and for being friends of the work that we do. Um, the work that we do, I think, takes on an interesting and unique character. First of all, let me say that for folks who enjoyed this conversation, uh, you can join us for our next America's Public Forum event at the end of February. It's going to deal with politics and Congress. And next week, we are going to be having a formal Braver Angels debate on whether or not uh, gender uh, youth programs should be protected by law. And that'll be on February 10th, and you should see links to a, a one or perhaps both of these events uh, in the chat box below. But let me say just very quickly that for those of you who are interested in the work of bringing together the American people in a deeper understanding of one another for the purposes of preserving the progress of American democracy and building upon it, even in the midst of these trying times, for those of you who are interested in that work, I encourage you to join us as a member because it is a unique thing to be a part of a social phenomenon that on the one hand is a movement espousing an elevation of our understanding of one another in a way that pretends a shift in our culture, that at the same time is also institution building, because we are building structures for dialogue, relationship, and the advocacy of reform through Braver Angels that we seek to take deep roots in American civil society in ways that can spring up in bearing fruit for the larger institutions of American democracy. This work is meaningful, it is impactful, it is consequential. And in the course of it, you will make friendships and relationships and gain understandings with and of your fellow Americans that you will carry with you for the rest of your lives. And there are thousands of people across America who can tell you the stories of the very relationships of that matter that they have built through this organization, more than that, through the community that it anchors. And so, we are deeply grateful to all of you for being here with us tonight, for listening to these two extraordinary thinkers, and for being a part of our effort to build a house united. 
in the United States of America. So until next time, thank you all very much, and we will see you again.